great to see you all. Um, yeah, I mean, look, you know, I was very lucky. Uh, uh, three wonderful things happened to me when I was four years old. First of all, I discovered glitter, magic markers, and plastic scissors, and things have never changed. Every day I skip into my studio with my glitter, magic markers, and plastic scissors. Second, fishing. I was born in the East End, four years old. My dad was always worried about us because obviously kids, we need to learn about nature. There's lots of canals and ponds, so I could go fishing. My dad taught us fishing. We used to go fishing. Third great thing that happened to me was I was sent to school and sent back a bit quick because they said, this kid is fucking wild and he can't be taught. So therefore, I was very lucky and I was sent back. Obviously, I had lots of learning difficulties. Um, now they've all come out, but um, the predominant one was at that um, age, uh, my dad had a dear friend. My dad worked in the meat market in Smithfield. He had lots of amazing friends because he was an artist. My mum was a sculptor. And luckily for me, he had a friend called Dennis Gray, head of IPC magazines, who married a woman from New Zealand. And she was a learning difficulty teacher, saw me as a four-year-old and said, this kid has got severe dyslexia. I've never read a book in my life because I still can't. It's like a jar of wasps. You put one in and 12 fly out. Doesn't come in. It does not go in. So I was very fortunate that Valerie said, look, uh, Dennis is doing well at IPC magazines. I will home teach thee. So I never went to school. So I used to go to their house every morning at four years old, and I would do my studies with Valerie in the morning. But luckily for me, Dennis, IPC magazines had three publications that he loved, that he looked after. Practical boat builder, practical homeowner, and practical woodworker which meant if he was going to do a story on how to build a mirror dinghy, he'd have to make it, photograph it in stages, create the flat mechanical artwork. Well, he had a studio and a workshop in the house that I was taught. So at four years old, in the morning, doing my studies, in the afternoon, go into this amazing workshop with Dennis and start making a mirror dinghy for one of these articles. How to saw wood, how to varnish, how to use a sewing machine. And I did that. And it was just the best time of my life. And at five years old, my mum bought me a sewing machine. My mum's a good Jewish girl, and I got my sewing machine, and I started making all my own clothes. Now, when you're five, putting a zip in a pair of trousers is fucking difficult. But what was easy was to make long dresses. All my neighbours gave all their curtains. By the way, I'm not wearing curtains today, all right? This is Gucci, just for you to know. And, uh, and I would make all my own clothes um, and allowed to wear my own clothes and little blonde skinny kid barefoot in this house had the most amazing time. And then at 12 years old, Dennis then gave me my own publication in a magazine called Look and Learn. And I had where I would have to do an article every month. Everybody owned tortoises. If it was started, well, if it was started getting cold, I would design how to design and build the tortoise hibernation box. Um, and following month it would be Easter, how to decorate Easter eggs and make Easter cards. Got paid for it. Right result. All of a sudden, I had some money. Anyway, uh, a year later, 13, knock at the door. I open the door, funny enough, um, and there's a school board man standing there. I'm in a dress, long hair. He always doesn't think I'm Steve Edge. He fucking says, is your brother in? Like, no. <laughs> uh, straight away, definitely no. And uh, anyway, by law, I had to go to school. So Dennis wrote a fabulous letter for me. And he sent me to a posh school in Dulwich. He wrote to the art department and said, this kid's got to live in the art department which they accepted me. So every day I'm in this art department from 13 to 15. At 15, the head of art entered me in for European Artist of the Year, which was a big, a big competition. And I won it. I won all the categories. I created a big Lagonda car. My dad was restoring a Lagonda car in the garden on one of those poly tunnels. And uh, I used all the separate bits and the off cuts and bits of old motor that he had and created this big installation and won it. Um, my, my dad was a great guy because we had all sorts of animals. We had our own pet chimpanzee, believe it or not, um, in Bethnal Green, which was pretty wild then. Uh, uh, Primo, called Primo, used to sit at the dinner table with us, with guests. They used to come in and shit themselves, first of all, because, you know, it was a bit of a big chimp. Anyway, sort of, you know, once we'd finished eating, we'd pass the sweet packet around and Primo would get hold of the packet and everybody would go, it's amazing. Primo boss, I'd look in this packet, it's amazing. Get hold of the sweet, it's amazing. Get hold of the other end, it's amazing. Undo the sweet, throw the sweet away, I need a wrapper on cue. Every working time, this chip. Anyway, I won this competition. 
And luckily for me, Jim Henson and Frank Oz was there. And they said, would you like to come and work with us? I'm 15. And they said, yeah, come and work on The Muppet Show with us. So I did. So for two years, I worked on The Muppet Show. It was quite amazing. Every week, we had Debbie Harry, Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Shid Sharif, all these amazing people coming. And I was spoilt as a kid and had the most amazing time until there was a terrible shock. Biggest shock of my life when Jim Henson said, Steve, there's a man over the road at Elstree Studios. He loves all your work. He wants you to go, he wants you to go over there. So I said, well, why are you getting rid of me? He said, no, I'm not getting rid of you. It's just a big opportunity. He said, you've got to go. If you don't like what you see, you must come back. I went, OK, but I've got to go and see. He said, you've got to go and see a bloke called George Lucas. To which I went, who the fuck is George Lucas? He said, he's made a film called American Graffiti and you've got to go and meet him. Went over the road. Two tasty people took me upstairs into his big office, sat in front of this very nice man. He said, ah, oh, Steve, I love all your work. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, I want you to come and work with us. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to work in the art department. I said, what do you want me to do in the art department? He went, anything you want. Now, remember, glitter, magic, markers, plastic, scissors, right? I'm fucking happy. So I said, can I see the art department? Takes me to this amazing art department. Carpentry shops, plastic vacuum form machines, spray booths, ironmongery. Came back, I went, whoa, that's the best art department I've ever seen. He said, wow, what do you reckon? I said, what's the film going to be about? He said, oh, it's going to be the greatest science fiction film ever. He said, it's going to be called Star Wars. I went, what? I said, what do you reckon? I went, fuck, I love that name. That's a great name. So I did Star Wars. I worked in the art department, working on the Millennium Falcon, best briefs ever I've ever been given in my life. You know, I'd be sitting around a table full of all these amazing people. Uh, of course, as a kid, I thought I was terribly grown up, but a big table full of amazing people. And then Norman Reynolds would say to me, OK, Steve, this is your day. Uh, there's been a Zion cannon attack down on stage nine. I want you to make sure those stormtroopers look like they lost to the Zion cannon attack. Well, actually, brilliant. I know exactly what I've got to go and do. And I will go and make sure they lost that Zion cannon attack. I then worked on a film called Empire Strikes Back. While I was working on Empire Strikes Back, uh, we're working on the Dagobah system. George said to me, Steve, he said, we should have some snakes in these woods here. I went, yeah, my dad's got snakes. He went, oh, give him a ring. I rang my dad and my dad brought some boa constrictors and some reticulated pythons and all sorts of other species. And we dressed them in the trees and it was great. And because of that, funny enough, uh, when we did Raiders of the Lost Ark, my dad supplied all the snakes and it was my pet monkey in that. Oh, sorry. Back on. There's me. Oh. Oh, there. There's me at 23 with my pet monkey. There's Indiana Jones. And we had the most amazing time. Snuff was a funny little monkey. He got up to lots of mischief. And then funny enough, um, I was working in the art department. Spielberg came up and said, Steve, we need your help. The stunt woman will not go in the snake pit. She refuses. So I had my legs shaved and I wore the party dress. So next time you see Raiders of the Lost Ark, they're my nutmegs in that, uh, in, in that film. So it was great. And then, and then I finished Raiders. And then I said to, it was George Lucas and Steven Spielberg in that film. And I said, boys, I'm going to finish. I'm 23 now. I want to set my own thing up. I said, I've always loved brands. I love the power of the brand. I said, and you know what? You've taught me the best thing of all, stories. You've created the world's best stories. And if you have a good story, you want to tell someone. And if it's a bad story, you don't tell anybody. I said, I'm, I'm going to work with brands and I'm going to create the best brands in the world. I said, because that's what I want to do. I want to tell that great story. And I said, and because of my issue about there's too much information out there, even people that can read, there's too much information. Look at today on websites, too much information. I said, so instead of being informational, I'm going to be inspirational. And instead of being literal, I'm going to be lateral. I said, I'm going to feed people components things into their head that they're going to create wow because that's the only way you're going to create wow otherwise it's you, you, you sort of never do that and so therefore i created up this i'm um, sorry created this agency all the great brands came to me from all over the world we did cartier we did fordham and mason did skanska so robert all these amazing brands but what was interesting for me it was about what does that mark mean that badge your badge the logo and the logo is very important because, first of all, it has to be memorable. We know that. It has to be beautiful. We know that. And it has to be easy to use. Because if your brand, your logo is difficult to use, then all of a sudden you start using it in wrong places and it doesn't work. And, of course, the whole thing about a mark, the badge, is, you know, 
look at that amazing mark, you know, whether you like it or not, the Mercedes badge, once seen, never forgotten. Whether you like a German car, a luxury car, it doesn't matter. Once you see it, bang, you know exactly what it is. And we know that's the power of the brand. And of course, you know, where did that mark come from? You know, the mark, where did it, where did it originate from? Well, 5,000 years ago, they found a cave in south of France and there was a beautiful bison painting on the wall and there was a mark by the side of it and they said that was the badge of the owner of the bison. That was the first logo ever found 5,000 years ago. Then it goes to the 12th century knights in shining armor, armor all knocking shit out of their owners well because they can't tell who, fucking who they are because they're all dressed the same. It's like, fucking no, you just done one of ours. Well, okay, let's create... Let's create the coats of arms. Let's have the coats of arms. So we're the good, look who we are. And that's the baddies. Let's go and get them. And then it goes to the, you know, Romans 800. They created the power of the brand in a sense, you know, the value of the brand. There was lots of dodgy wine, dodgy product, people buying it, eating it, dying. And they said, from now on, you've got to put what's in the product, when it was made, how old. And that's where the value of the brand came. And it goes right down to the Industrial Revolution. And you look at mass, produce, uh, sorry, mass producing of lots of products and branding really played its part. And what did it one best of all was Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola making brown sugar water. Or I had a bit of cocaine in it, which was a result, I presume. But, you know, brown sugar water. And therefore, it was mass produced and people would nick it and rip it off. And that was a problem. So they created, they said, you know what? We're going to create the Coca-Cola bottle, a bottle that was so expensive to make, but no one could produce that bottle apart from Coca-Cola because it was so expensive and that was their product. And that's what made Coca-Cola great. And of course, you know, we're now coming to, when it comes to the power of the brand, the great story for me was when Enzo, 1923, walked into a small village in, in, in Italy and there was Madame Baracca, one of his great, great relatives. And she said, Enzo, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to make a car. I'm going to make the best car in the world. I'm going to make a car so beautiful that everybody will want it. Most desirable car. She went, that's amazing. She said, as you know, my son was a war hero in the First World War. He was a pilot. He, he was a great fighter pilot um, in a biplane. And unfortunately, he was killed. However, as a gift, and he would love this, I know, I'm going to gift you on the side of his plane. He'd painted a rampant horse, a black rampant horse. She said, I'm going to give you that, and that will bring you good luck. And that will live in the spirit of my son. And he went, thank you. And of course, we know what happened. The thing about AI and branding is, for me, it's about emotional intelligence. It's about, it's about passion. It's about personality. And I'll tell you a very quick story. Am I all right? Thank you. A very quick story. One was that I was asked to brand the first build to rent company that came over here from America. Build to rent, big hundreds of apartments, doing it really well, breakout areas, gymnasiums, community-led. Uh, American Pension Fund M3, billions and billions of dollars. And these guys came to me and said, Steve, can they, and they came from a company called um, Essential Land, said, can I name this company? So we came up with Essential Living. We love this word, Essential Living. Living, now everybody nicks it, although we've done all the other built to rent brands. And... We created this brand. Anyway, the company went incredibly well, took off. After about three or four years, the three guys who created this company, one of them, unfortunately, they didn't particularly like, the Americans didn't like him. He, he was ex Barclay Homes managing director. He said, we're gonna kick you out. He had to go and he, had, he was really upset. They got rid of him and he, he came to see me. He said, Steve, I can't believe it. He said, I set this company up. I was the one that created it. They've got me off the board and now I'm free. Now, this guy's wild. Okay? He's a wild guy. He's incredibly funny. He's incredibly nice. He's actually a, a super bright guy. And he said, Steve, I need you to create a new brand for me. He said, because I'm done. I'm, I'm done from them. I need a logo. I need an identity. I need the story. I went, OK. A few weeks later, he came to me. I said, it's done. Come and see me. Come to the studio. You ready? He said, yeah. He sits down, projects on the wall. I say, this is the name of your company. This is a great fuel. Flicks through to the next application, showing him business cards, letters, going all the way through to web page. Come back. I said, okay, what do you reckon? He went, oh, that's okay. I said, this fuel was okay. So I'm like, you said, I get it. Uh, you know, we need fuel. We need fuel to 
go forward, we need fuel for energy. I went, no, no, you're wrong. You haven't got it. He went, I haven't got it. I went, no. I said, you ready? He went, yeah. He said, what is it? I went, fuck you, essential living. We went bonkers. <laughs> he had a wank, excuse me. He went absolutely bonkers. Fuck, he went, that's fantastic. That is fantastic. Fuck you, essential living. Now, I don't think AI could possibly do that. Maybe in the future, but at the moment, definitely not. However, last but not least, uh, I was, again, another realisation, very fortunate, from the fourth, went to nine years old. In all poor families, you have a rich aunt. And I had a rich aunt. I had the best rich aunt ever. She used to buy all my artworks, my drawings, my little furniture I had made for her. And I went round there with my mum one day at nine years cabinets full of glass and china and all sorts of stuff and i said to my aunt when do you use all this she said on special occasions and five days later she died and she never used anything she never used nothing and i said to my mum i went mum you know what i said i know i've got my sunday best i said and i'm nine years old i said but look, look what happened to my aunt i said you know what I said, from now on, Mum, I'm going to dress for a party every day. I said, and the party will come to me. I'm not going to wait for a special occasion because we're such a long time dead. So all of you guys here, get your best little silver backless number on tomorrow. Get that white whistle on right, that I know you've got. And trust me, the party will come to you. And if you ever find yourself in Shoreditch, knock on our Bobby Moore and I'll be there for a party. Please join me. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.